We are uh, good to get going at this point. So um, yeah, let's let's dive in. So uh, usual housekeeping stuff uh, for those who are new to Scandivan University or Clear Edge webinars. Um, uh, everybody's muted. Please ask questions via uh, the questions panel in GoToMeeting, uh, GoToWebinar. So um, if you've got a question or if you just want to heckle uh, uh, Nathan uh, or, or comment uh, to Sylvie how well behaved his daughter is in the background as she's drawing, um, you know, that is, uh, you're welcome to do so. Uh, we will answer questions at the end. Uh, we've got a big, uh, you know, action-packed hour of content. So our Q&A, we usually do after the time slot. So. Uh, but all that stuff is recorded. It'll be in the recording that's sent out to everybody. Uh, and uh, and Sylvie has kindly volunteered oh, here on this side. Sylvie has kindly volunteered uh, uh, to uh, help sp uh, sponsor Scandabim University. And he is going to be our Q&A uh, maestro. So Sylvie is going to be also answering questions on social media, uh, on LinkedIn, um, and through some blog posts and uh, things. So. Uh, as questions come in, if we don't get to them, uh, ah, this way, Sylvie, uh, Sylvie will, uh, will come in and help you out. <laughs> so, yeah, obviously, as I said, it's recorded. Uh, so that includes the webinar, and we'll send that link out about a week or so afterwards. So if anybody missed it, uh, you know, that, that talks to you is like, oh, I wish I was there, tell them to register, and they'll get the recording link. Anyone that registers gets the recording link. So with that, um, some introductions. Um, Scott, why don't uh, why don't you kick us off here? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, sir. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Glad to be on with uh, Nathan and Silvio, and uh, always happy to be associated with Clear Edge and their good products. And they've been a great partner of Prolog. Prolog's company we I founded with two other partners seven years ago, and we do scan to them work, and so all sorts of scanning. Uh, not all sorts, I guess. It's uh, terrestrial laser scanning and mobile scanning with their uh, several unit of NavViz units that allow for the, the mobile. We've been very pleased with that. And we're essentially a Faro shop, but we're also technology agnostic. We're open to all sorts of different things. And uh, scanning is one side of our business. The other side is converting up all that scan data over into models for our clients who are primarily architects, engineers, and um, general contractors. So. A lot of use for clear edge and other tools we've got a, a broad toolbox a deep toolbox and we pull in all of those different uh, things to allow us to do our work thanks kelly nathan you you sir are up next all right thanks kelly uh so yeah i i think i asked you i wasn't quite sure why why i'm here because <laughs> the extent of my uh scan and bim experience ended in around 2012 with some early uh, Tecla to uh, Trimble robotic total station back and forth on some uh, foundation points. And uh, what, oh man, you should have seen how crude it was trying to bring in a point cloud into Tecla. We had to create these little crosshairs. It was just a mess. But you know, different tools, different fit for purpose. But uh, yeah, I've sort of since then become a, a generalist. And uh, if, if you're not familiar with the Construction Progress Coalition, uh, uh, Clear Edge is a member along with a plenty of other uh, technology solution providers, AEC members. Um, and we're really trying to solve this data interoperability challenge. And so much of the challenge is that we don't actually understand what we want. We, we don't know our requirements. We don't know what's good data from bad data. Uh, and so trying to have that kind of higher level conversation. So if, if, if you hear me chime in, it'll probably be because I'm asking either a, a quote-unquote stupid question or one that will lead to an, an interesting discussion, hopefully. Yeah, and Nathan is undergoing uh, a new project. Uh, he's renovating his house and taking uh, advantage of uh, the opportunity and the Construction and Progress Coalition to actually document the process, uh, kind of soup to nuts the way uh, CPC does, uh, but focused on scandabim and reality capture. Capture. So yes. we had some great conversations the last uh, couple months, and so uh, that's that's why I dragged him on. Uh, yeah, and Sylvie. Uh, oh gosh, dang it! It's yeah, I'm the other side. Take it away, sir. <laughs> me on my picture. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Sylvie. Um, probably uh, you guys, uh, you know, heard this uh, introduction last session. I uh, started RC Monkeys in 2018. Uh, we're a small company that uh, focuses on high-end uh, building documentation. 
um, and also analysis. So those are our main uh, focuses. And uh, we do a lot of interesting projects. Um, and our experience uh, starts back in 2000 and I believe 10. So we've been doing this for uh, quite a long time. And, um, you know, we are a Leica shop uh, compared to, you know, what Scott does. So I think it's great to have uh, two different users here, two different types of tools. And I think we're going to have a great discussion about cleaning. This is always a, a interesting topic. I want to I want to hear what other people are doing, and you know they're cleaning or not, they're not cleaning. So uh, thank you, Kelly, for um, having me again on on this um, webinar. Absolutely. And uh, for those of you that uh, are new and don't know me, uh, I'm Kelly with uh, ClearEdge Three D. Um, uh, run our industry strategy. Well, actually, uh, we're doing a little org shuffle. I'm now uh, VP of project management again, so <laughs> with moving things around. Uh, so I have to, I have to, I have to fix that and get used to it. Uh, chair of the technology committee. I need to remove the vice. I keep forgetting to remove the vice. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, spent a lot of time. Worked with basically everybody here in some form or fashion, uh, and. Uh, yeah, love putting these things together. So you said you were chair of the previously vice, now chair of the technology committee of what? The US IBD. Ah, oh, okay. I didn't hear that part. Institute of, that. of man, that's that's a five lever acronym. What is that FLA? Uh, the, the the yeah yeah. Uh, isn't it strange that FLA has an FLA by the way? Oh, anyway. Um, uh, it's the U.S. Institute of Building Documentation. We talk about it on every one of these Scandinavian University sessions because it's a great organization that has all sorts of resource, resources for people doing scan to BEM. Uh, so please check it out, www.usibd.org. Um, uh, all sorts of wonderful stuff on there. We'll probably hit things along the way. So, uh, yeah, and actually I think CPC is kind of partnered with them, right? Maybe. Yep, yep, they are one of our collaboration partners and uh, yeah, always trying to promote uh, the standards and specs they're coming out with. Absolutely, all right. Well, with that, let's dive in to dirty data. Uh, and I should probably take a moment, let me see if I can find this, it's because because Paolo sent it to me. Uh, we had a little Twitter contest and Let's see, we had a winner for our Dirty Data Twitter contest, and now I'm trying to find it. Uh -oh. I have a feeling I know who submitted it. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm not seeing it, Paula. If you could send it to me, tell me where you sent it to me. It's not in my email and it's not on Teams. <laughs> Shared pains. Shared pains. It's, it's been filtered. Your Your IT department filtered it. Kelly. Oh, I found it. It's in the chat for the webinar. All right. Yeah, we're going to pull it up. We're going to pull it up. Nicholas Jacob Loyola. Here we go. So um, apparently this is the Dirty Data winner. Um, uh, so uh, Nicholas will be sending you a t-shirt, a Scandinavian University t-shirt, which we are all modeling except for Scott, who uh, is, is um, too cool for the Scandinavian University t-shirt. I have it here, though. I have it here. I'm sorry I'm not donning it right now. <laughs> so we will uh, send that out, uh, Nicholas. And then, um, yeah, anyway, uh, we've got some runners up and things, and we'll we'll send announcements out on Twitter for that. But uh, thank you for participating and sharing that, uh, that project with lots of, I would call that, uh, well, let's get into it. Actually, let's talk about the different types of noise, and then we can we can classify what was in that uh, at the end. So. What we see here on my screen is, of course, really dirty data, but there's a lot of different types of dirty data. So, um, yeah, what do we want to start with? I think mixed pixel noise is a great one to start with. So, for those of you that are unfamiliar with laser scanners, like their kind of internal guts, um, what's essentially happening with, with mixed pixel noise uh, is going to be the laser has a size. The laser is not infinitely small, right? So the laser is is you know let's say it's about an eighth of an inch circle, and I I'll usually have my little laser pointer with me. But uh, if you imagine that laser beam hitting the edge of something, and only part of the laser being on that edge, 
and then that lay the other half of the laser beam continuing and hitting another surface that's behind it, right? So what you get there is there's basically two returns to the scanner because the scanner you know shoots out photons, waits for photons to bounce back. And so it's looking for that return. And of course, if things are relatively close together, right? You know, if you're talking like in this case on the screen, a stair uh, right, that you see right here, well, the bottom tread of that stair and the ground are close enough to each other that instead of seeing this as two discrete returns, the scanner sees it as one kind of long extended return, at which point it drops the little dot you know, roughly somewhere in between the edge of the stair and the floor. And where it sits will depend on how much of the laser was on the stair and how much of the laser was on the floor. So, you know, 60% of the laser is on the stair and 40% is on the floor. It's closer to the stair. If it's the other way around, it's closer to the floor. So this is just basically like photons getting split across surfaces, bouncing back physics stuff. Um, but uh, but yeah, this is this is mixed pixel noise, and this is this is something I hear a lot from people. We actually had a lot of questions in previous webinars. Um, so from our panelists, who actually bothers to clean this stuff out? Um, not manually. <laughs> not manually. Not uh, manually. Yeah. Right. So uh, um, so yeah, most scanners uh, in the firmware and uh, on the import process into the registration software. Most of them have some pretty advanced filters that are designed to get rid of this. So this this scan, I actually had to go back to a scan I did like nine years ago uh, to find mixed pixel noise this bad um, that it was you know this blatantly obvious. Most of the time now, we uh, <laughs> we uh, we get this uh, very only on very very close surfaces, uh, things that are just a couple inches apart. Uh, because the the filters are getting so good now that you know unless things are just really close together the scanner can discern this and basically filter out that second return or the first return and get it um so there's a lot of automated ways on import or just on the scanner itself to clean this stuff out um this is probably there are, the, there are yeah. a couple of points there's some some really good third party applications out there as well that can ride along and so there's a lot of different ways to think about edge noise and the best ones are those that have sliders or you can adjust how aggressively you want to filter out edge noise uh because there's the the scanner actually is has a difficult time to understand what is edge noise and what is actually the edge of a of a wall at a very oblique angle so the ability to fine tune that based on your needs and then run that filter is very helpful. Another thing that I've learned uh, early on in this career of dealing with laser beams is that a laser is not truly a sort of parallel projection of photons. Because you know, a conventional light disperses like that. A laser we think of as being just a single beam. It does have width, but it also has a focal point. And that focal point, Kelly, you can talk to this better than I can, but it has a finite distance from the scanner or the center uh, location of the scanner at which that beam is the very smallest. It comes out of the gun at some diameter that is bigger than where it converges, oftentimes in some sort of single number digits of meters away, and then it diverges from that. So your measurements at 200 meters may be the size of a silver dollar. The, 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 the beam may be that big and is so, far more susceptible to edge noise. If I just said anything incorrect, please correct me, but that is my Spot understanding. That's perfect. <laughs> Spot on. Yeah. And this this is one of those things that's also, you know, this kind of falls into the you get what you pay for category. Um, different scanners will have different mechanisms for handling that focal point. So um, there's there's a there's kind of the the cheap mechanism, which is from an optical standpoint. Uh, it, which is basically close to the scanner is good, far from the scanner is bad. And some of the cheapest scanners will have, uh, you know, this kind of ba basically, you know, the laser is minimally minimally focused, and you'll hit that focal point very close to the scanner and everything else. But you can also there's something called collimating the laser beam, and that's actually running it through a bunch of different lenses so that when it leaves, rather than you having a normal dispersal pattern the beams are actually made the the photons are actually kind of pulled into a much more parallel path so you have that kind of um 
optimal size of the laser beam for a really long distance. I mean, by that I still mean like hundreds of meters as opposed to, or tens of meters, right? But you know, you're at some point it gets bigger, right? So like you said, 200 meters is going to be the size of a silver dollar. But with some of the kind of low end units that aren't collimated, you know, you're talking about something the size of the silver dollar, 20 meters from the scanner or 30 meters from the scanner. Um, you know, some of the mobile pucks aren't, you can't collimate something with, you know, a fan array of, of, uh, of uh, laser sensors. So, so yeah, um, and that's actually a good opportunity to kind of talk about, uh, I actually skipped range noise and measurement noise because uh, I, was, I was looking at my slide and yay, mixed pixel noise. Um, so everybody is, uh, you know, I, I, we actually got this question last uh, the last session uh, about you know are, are do laser scanners make perfect measurements? Um, and the answer is no. There is no perfect measurement. There's no such thing. You cannot make a perfect observation. Um, there is no there is no measurement technology in the world that makes a perfect measurement. Uh, there is always some error in any measurement. And with a laser scanner, um, you know we talk about noise. Um, and of course, what we're really talking about is the fact that, you know, there's always some amount of error in each individual measurement, which is why if you slice a laser scan, you don't have a perfectly smooth surface. So I'm going to pull something up here just as an example of that. So I already have it prepped. Uh, da -da -da, if I can find it. There we go. I had this pulled up earlier and then I had to restart my computer. Here we go, section slice. So let's pull that up. So this is, this is a section through a bunch of different uh, laser scans. Uh, and what you can see here as we get really close, you know, this is, this is not a perfectly thin surface. This is a, you know, a sheetrock ceiling. It should be a perfect line, right? Right, because it is. If I cut a slice through it, there is it. It, it is not this thick, right? You know, we're talking about probably a, an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch of noise in this scan data on a sheetrock surface, and that comes from, of course, the fact that uh, the the actual measurement of the laser has a uh, has a, has an error to it, right? Um, you know, we're recording little tiny you know micro well, nanoseconds of time because uh, we're basically looking for the photons to go out and bounce back and the amount of time it takes for that to happen tells us the range that's that's light ranging right um and so uh, you know and now with phase based scanners we're also looking at waveform and things like that but point being it's such a tiny amount of time we do everything we can to measure it super precisely, the people that make the hardware, but there is some some error to it, right? Uh, there's also the material qualities of the surface, right? If it's, a, if it's a black surface versus a white surface, it reflects light differently. Um, Hyper-reflective surfaces, if, if anybody's seen my little social media um, uh, avatar, it's a scan of me wearing a safety vest, and you'll notice it looks like I've got like the world's fattest suspenders on. It's because the hyper-reflective material of my safety vest actually effectively it accelerates light. And so when the light hits it and bounces back, it looks closer to the scanner than it actually is. And so there's all sorts of interesting photonics that you, you know, kind of stuff that you're dealing with um, when you're doing this. So there's some error. Um, and then of course, the angular precision of the instrument. There's also some error. It, it tracks rotation really precisely vertically and horizontally as the scanner moves, but there is some imprecision. And all of those things add up to kind of a, a point accuracy of the measurement of a couple millimeters plus or minus on the best scanners and, you know, five millimeters, 10 millimeters plus or minus on the cheapest scanners, uh, sometimes 25 millimeters plus or minus on the really cheap scanners. Um, uh, and for people that are uh, interested in uh, imperial units, that'd be plus or minus an eighth of an inch on the best or 16th of an inch on the best scanners, all the way down to plus or minus an inch on some of the worst scanners. So um, but you can fake that, Kelly. You can fake it after the fact, not fake it, but there are filters that allow you to tolerate those greater deviations, right? Yes. And actually that's so. So one of the key things to keep in mind, right, is that um, this kind of noise is something that's called statistically distributed. 
which is like, I'm sorry to geek out on our audience here, but um, basically any kind of noise that's statistically distributed, you can mathematically correct for it using averaging techniques. So this is actually the way total stations achieve submillimeter accuracy on measuring prisms and measuring points. What they do is they take um, tens or hundreds of measurements of that point, average all the measurements, because the average is going to be the you know the closest fit to the final location every individual measurement will have some error but they take multiple measurements and average it with scanners it's similar but we don't measure the same point a hundred times we instead measure all the points on the surface that you know within a grid pattern but we you know there are you know on one of these beams that i've got here and given this is a pretty thin slice but i mean you can see on this ceiling between all my scans i've got you know there's got to be 10,000 points on this little slice of ceiling, right? And so, you know, when when that data is is basically brought in, basically the middle, the aggregate, the average of that data is going to be where that that surface is actually located for all the same reasons. It's statistically distributed. All the other noise that we're talking about is not statistically distributed. So uh, transient, mixed pixel, blah blah blah, that we'll get into next, not statistically distributed. So you can't, you know, there, there's a lot of different techniques to deal with that data, but you can't just, you know, make it disappear through averaging or things like that. It's a, uh, it's, it's a very different, uh, different kind of noise. So Kelly, um, if I may interject here, uh, you mentioned about um, taking multiple measurements and then averaging uh, those measurements. And uh, I mean, there are a lot of scanners that actually do that. You can have the option to do um, up to eight measurements. Um, so is is you know evidently is a lot slower, but he's uh, is shooting the same point eight times, and then he's uh, averaging all those eight measurements. And that's the you know to the extreme. Uh, you start with one, and then you can increase uh, to two, four, and eight. At least that's how Leica scanners work, and I believe the Ferro scanners will work the same with the quality levels. Any any phase based scanner that is what the quality setting is doing. It's it's basically using a hybrid approach. You're still oversampling on a grid, but also you're you're oversampling on each individual point. That's so absolutely if, correct. Yeah. If you're increasing that quality, uh, that surface will look more like a line than um, you know a, a thicker uh, surface, right? The thicker slice through uh, through it. So it depends what you what you want to get. Yeah. And that is that is one of those things where, like yeah, Scott mentioned earlier, the NavVis scanners, and you know, there's a lot of mobile scanners, and they're all using pretty much the same sensors. Right? This is a maybe a dirty little secret. Um, all the scanners that are in the world are pretty much made out of the exact same parts, sourced from the exact same companies, whether it's terrestrial or mobile. Every mobile scanner is using either a Velodyne uh, laser puck or a Hokuyo puck, or you know, there's like three providers, right? Uh, that pretty much everybody uses. Um, the the fiber laser that's in an RTC 360 is the same fiber laser that's in a, a ZNF 5016. It's the same, you know. Like, I, I actually, to be clear, I'm not saying factually that's the case. I'm saying generally speaking, it's the same component sourced from the same manufacturers, right? So Kelly, you might get some hate mail as a result of that disclosure. You notice I rolled that back ever so slightly. I'm not yeah. saying specifically, but in general, you know, this scanner back here behind my head is going to have the same fiber laser components in it that it's in 10 other scanners um, because they all buy from the same vendor. And then the people that make the scanners assemble these things, right? And then they write the firmware, and that's where they put their secret sauce. And you know that's why something like an RTC performs differently than something like a ZNF, which performs differently from something like a P20, because they're balancing out all the mathematics that go into that and tuning, basically tuning it for certain conditions, right? Which is why a P20, a P30, a P40, a P50. You know, it's all pretty much the same hardware, it's just different firmware settings because they're tuning for range, they're tuning for accuracy, they're tuning for speed, they're different firmware settings, right? Um, so it's yeah. actually Kelly, it's very interesting to um compare scanners again against each other and just position them in the same location and see how they perform on the same surfaces. And you'll be surprised that you know some scanners they do well on uh let's say Y surfaces. Uh, others, you know, you might get a lot of noise on those those surfaces. 
um, and they they perform better on other types of surfaces. So there's no one scanner that perform performs the best on all of the surfaces. So you get, right. you, you know you need to be aware of um, their limitations. Yeah. And it's wild to think almost all of them have the same subcomponents. Yeah. It's just it's all that tuning um, that goes into it, and so it's uh, it's just one of those kind of it's one of those interesting things I found out when I. <laughs> crossed over and uh, uh, joined the dark side, uh, so to speak. So, um, so yeah, well, let's, uh, let's hop into talking about reflected and refracted noise, because this is probably our biggest question that we get from our uh, audience uh, across all of the, the webinars. So um, what we've got here on my screen is uh, basically data, the scan location was outside, but you'll see there's this red and orange data that's inside this building. Um, uh, and, uh, and basically uh, that data is captured through the glass, right? And so it's the same ceiling inside and out that was in this building, it was a plaster ceiling on both. Uh, you see it's a different, uh, totally different reflectance value because it's passing through glass twice. Uh, and if I cut a section through this data, you'll actually see that the ceiling is at a slight angle. Um, and that's because, again, refraction causes the light to bend, right? So when the light enters and exits the glass, it gets it gets bent and it doesn't come out at precisely the same angle that it went in. And so uh, any data captured through glass is inherently somewhat inaccurate. How inaccurate is a question of how many layers of glass, uh, what kind of film is on the glass, how dirty was the glass, how, <laughs> like there's lots of things that go with it. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, glazing, any, any kind of glazing is a nightmare for scanning. I think Scott, yeah. you brought something up in the pre-session that was, uh, that sometimes it's worse and sometimes it's better. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, my brain was stuck on something I wanted to ask you because of your, uh, back to your previous comment that you'd said, light refracts when it goes through glass. And indeed that is the case, unless, unless it's perfectly perpendicular to the surface. Uh, but don't rely on that as a mitigating factor. But it's interesting to think about, you just, this is coming sort of full circle to your hardware thing. You said that most of these scanners have the same hardware on the inside. Does that mean that they also all operate at the same wavelength of light? So most scanners are operating, at, there, there's three pretty common wavelengths. And, and so actually, if you look at the wavelength, you can probably tell whether or not it's the same fiber laser in one scanner to another scanner to another scanner. Um, now, the company that makes the fiber lasers for one wavelength also makes the fiber lasers for another, another wavelength. And so, you know, it may just be that they've tuned the source to a different wavelength and everything else is the same. But there's typically you're dealing with a couple of different wavelengths. Generally, scanners avoid visible light because visible light uh, can hurt your eyes. Um, so if it's a visible light laser, it has to be a much low in lower intensity beam. If it's a non-visible la laser, and most people right now are using uh, near ultraviolet, so they're they're going on the high end of the spectrum, um, and that allows. Uh, there's various reasons for that in terms of a, a waveform and everything else, but it's uh, it, most most of the scanners on the market right now are using that. Uh, there are some low uh, low end uh, infra infrared lasers, but. Well, the reason I bring that up is because you mentioned refracting through glass. And if you think of the Pink Floyd sort of prism with the light going through and it creates a rainbow, different uh, wavelengths of light or spectrums of light will have behaved differently going through glass. So some scanners may have more refracted uh, sort of inaccuracies or noise than others. Just an observation made right now as you made this point. Yeah. And Kelly, I mean, for uh, for me, is anything that goes through glass is erroneous. Like, I would just, I would not rely on that that data, um, unless, I mean, I, I don't know, you know who who gave you the tip to place a target, double printed target on the back as a Scott. I no, think Scott. that that you know, the, the this yeah, you know, that would be the only. Um, you know, the only event where I would use data that was captured behind the glass. Yeah, the range is so close that, yeah. the, the, you know, you're talking fractions of a fraction of a millimeter. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that was a great tip, though. 
Um, but yeah, so so this data, you kind of, you know, you want to clean it up. I think um, I was going to pull up a station real quick here in Cyclone, if I can find one that's got some data through us and then just kind of clean Kelly, it up. I can give you, um, uh, while you're pulling that up, um, you know, there are uh, some data that you want to clean up before uh, you start your registration or optimizing the alignment between scans using a cloud-to-cloud -cloud, um, algorithm. And then there's some data that you can um, leave in and then cl uh, clean before the, uh, the export. So you need to know when you should go through the effort of cleaning everything before the registration and when you should uh, do it all at once at the end. Um, so hopefully, uh, you know, a lot of the registration software out there will give you those two options. Um, if they don't, uh, that's going to be um, a workflow that you would not prefer because it removes some flexibility and it adds time to, to that process. Yeah, that, that is a great point. Let me, let me turn all of these off here. I unfortunately spent, you know, like a, a, a day cleaning all this stuff out and then um, uh, <laughs> then Murphy's Law, now I want to show it. <laughs> I got to turn it back on. Oh, it's cleaned out of that too. All right. Hey, so yeah, my, 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 uh, my rule of thumb is I would, I would only clean data that goes through glass that could affect registration. So if uh, 20 to 50% of the data from one station went through the glass. So if my station is very close to a window, then I would clean that uh, prior of optimizing the that cloud to cloud um, constraint. If it's just a little bit like Kelly just uh, showed on his screen, I will leave that in um, and clean it right before the export. Uh, there's um, only one situation where I would clean that data before um, the registration and that is if we have interior glazing. So if you're scanning, for instance, a, a mole, that's the worst, like one of the worst uh, projects that you can scan because you have the, the storefronts inside of the building. So pretty much, you know, 30 to 40 to 50% of your data is gonna go through some sort of glazed surface. Um, so it is a nightmare to, to clean that data and uh, it needs to be done if, if that's going to affect the registration, it needs to be done prior of optimizing those scans. So you need to do it one by one. There's no, uh, there's no solution to to do it all at once, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, and I think you know what I was hoping to show, but apparently I did too good of a job uh, cleaning. Basically, you can, this you is can undo the, the your what you clean. Uh, hey, walk me through that. I, I can't remember how to do it for a given. Yeah. Scan. Uh, select the cloud. Go to Tools, Scanner, Restore, and then restore um, your... Um, this is this is why I have Sylvie here at all times. Sylvie, Sylvie knows Cyclone. I can't find my bar on the cycle. There we go. There we go. Perfect. All right. Lovely. So pick my scan, Tools. I don't really want to do this. Scanner. And then restore default cloud from Scanner. There we go. Look at that, Sylvie. You're so good. Mm. So you guys can see there's all this kind of data and I presume I can undo that. Uh, there's all this data that's captured kind of outside these windows and a lot of it, you know, all of it basically is noise. It's bogus. You can see it kind of goes out for forever. It's kind of, you know, there's all sorts of problems this creates. This is probably not at the level that Sylvia was saying where it would impact the registration but uh, cleaning this up inside of a scan, a uh, single scan sometimes is easier than cleaning it up in a group because it's basically always, if you're at the scanner location, you can basically just draw a rectangle, uh, well, a parallelogram, uh, and then you grab all those points inside it, and then you just basically hit delete. And if you've got a couple of big rectangles, you can just really quickly knock this out in the scan. So whether you do it before you register or after you register, who cares? Uh, you know, that's that's more uh, for on a project like this. Mm -hmm. uh, none of that would cause a registration error. But um, if, uh, like I said, interior or for a lot of it's through glass, sometimes this is a quick way to clean it up. 
um, just go through and window them. If you've got a big curtain wall, it's probably not the way to go. Um, then you're going to want to do things like go into orthographic view and, you know, clip it out in plan, clip your point cloud so you don't have the overhang in it, so you don't select it. There's a lot of kind of manual techniques. This is one of those areas where I'm blown away that nobody has a better way to clean this data out yet automatically. Yeah. Uh, and my, my, my rule is uh, if it takes, uh, it should take less than a minute per scan. If it takes more than a minute, I mean, imagine having um, a project with thousands of scans, how long uh, that takes to clean. So a lot of times cleaning takes more than the registration process, especially now that you're pre-aligning the scans in the field. It definitely adds a lot of time to that registration process. And uh, one trick to move fast, uh, you can do it the way Kelly showed from the position of the scanner, and you can just uh, you know, crop whatever regions you want to clean. The other uh, solution is um, you create, at least in Cyclone, you create a temporary coordinate system that will allow you uh, for the scan to be ortho, you know, um, orthographic, uh, orthogonal, I'm sorry, on the screen. That way you can use your uh, rectangular box to, to just chop the data around your building and you just do it in like two clicks. So, yep. um, which, which works if you have a rectangular building and you don't have overhangs that you want to keep. Correct. And you can... <laughs> That's exactly. Correct. Exactly. Um, and, uh, if, if you do have overhangs and you need to, you know, in that, that case, I would recommend using, uh, slices and, uh, you can offset that slice, make sure that you match the thickness of the slice with the offset. That way you don't miss anything. So you're, if your thickness is one foot, your offset is going to be one foot. That way your slice is moving up uh, one foot at a time. So you, you know you're not going to have any areas that you're you're missing. This is yeah. this is fun. <laughs> yeah, Scott, <laughs> I'll, I'll just to add a, uh, I don't want this to get be a, a software specific discussion at all, but I think it's interesting or novel concept that has been explored. Not only explored, but we deploy it quite frequently. And it could apply to any registration software, mm -hmm. Cyclone or, or Scene or any other one, uh, which is a, a problem that we encounter quite often, which is imagine, and I'm sorry I don't have any visuals here, but imagine a facade of a building and you have a bunch of scans on the outside and a bunch of scans on the inside and a bunch of scans upstairs, downstairs, in the basement, and everything else. Imagine if you could define a plane on the front of that facade and say only clip the scans on that side or normal to that plane from six inches beyond the plane that you established and farther, basically clipping everything that's shot through the windows, but you keep the mullions and the muttons and all the, the sill plates and all of that stuff. And then do the same thing for all the scans that are in this project that are on that side, normal, clip them six inches offset that way. And there is, a, this is not an advertisement for Tag Labs, but they have developed some very clever algorithms that I wish the bigger players would incorporate some clever thinking like that to expedite our scan data cleanup. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really great point, and there are some really great third-party solutions to help with that that kind of stuff. Um, they're certainly not the only one, um, yeah. but they're a great example. All right, Scott, tell us tell us what's going on here. Um, we've kind of switched into the next type of noise. Um, What's going on where? Oh, huh. You're not sharing it. I unshared it so we could see your hand gestures. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> what is that mess you've got up? I don't know. You sent it to me. <laughs> they, that is, um, yeah, this is a plant facility, no big deal, but this is an environmental noise, right? In this case, it is steam or smoke, or I don't even know what the contents of that is. Uh, but it doesn't even really uh, show up in the RGB yeah. photograph very well. Mm -hmm. But when we were on site, we certainly knew that, that that was a factor. And sure enough, when you look at it in 3D view, um, it shows up as all of that nonsense that was distracting to the client when we were showing off the resolution of our scans. This is only one scan, a single scan, but you can imagine as we go around the plant, all that noise is just making a mess, a little mess. Yeah, and this this happens with steam. This happens with dust on construction sites. It happens with snow. It happens with rain. Um, and so this stuff, as you can imagine, uh, for anybody that's looking uh, watching this, is extremely difficult to clean out. 
um, there's there's not really a great way to get this data out uh, aside from just kind of manually clipping and clapping and you know going from different views generally uh, one one nice thing about it is that uh, generally speaking uh, the scanners have filters to eliminate this internally and uh, the the way that most of them do it is they they look for the brightest return and environmental noise usually doesn't have a very bright return so um, now snow is kind of the evil exception to this uh, but uh, so if you've got environmental noise you usually have it in areas that you don't have other stuff behind it right so you'll notice that like when we were in that 3d view or in that uh, view here and then popped into 3d uh, and looked around where did my look go oh, i'm not in 3d nah. why are you killing me you you're in 3d now yep i know i wanted to go back into real view and then 3d and now give me my look tool there we go that's what i wanted you'll oh, notice okay. that for the most part this data is not uh, you're not getting this data in front of stuff you care about you're getting it behind stuff you care about so in terms of clipping this stuff out you know whether it's recap or something else generally it's just going to be up in the sky and what you can do is be pretty rough about it i'm just using a really quick uh fence here right and hitting delete uh, i can look around again uh oh i love how recaps look tool doesn't actually prefer, prefer vertical up it's right. look tool ever all right whatever um point being you can look around and basically from the scanner view this is another one where you can generally clip stuff most of it out really quickly and then you can kind of clean up the stuff that was really close to your geometry uh, just by using the distance and kind of finding angles where you can crop it out and and just snip it, right? So, you know, pretend I'd actually done that successfully. Now I can go out and do it out here, right? For um, for this type of noise, uh, usually what I recommend is clipping it in a um, 3D view and setting your uh, mode to uh, perspective, um, because that way, if it's just orthographic, um, uh, you know, it's going to overlap. Um, it's going to try to project the that noise on top of the uh, the data underneath it. So perspective work works the best. But I'm curious yeah. if if you do a a two pass scan, since uh, this is you know it's going to be like a moving mass or moving you know the the snow and the the rain is not static. I'm curious if the two pass scan will remove all this noise. Mm. I think it would remove, this is speculation, Sylvia, but I, I suspect that it would remove 80%, but there's going to be sufficient number of just random duplication, random same return from your uh, multi-scan filter feature. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, what's going on, and so I'm surprised it doesn't blow up the scanner when it does this, because if you think about the math that's going on when it's shooting a, a steam or vapor cloud like that, um, if you look at in 3D, it actually looks like that that vapor is going, or the, the the cloud is steam is going all the way back to the scanner, which is not. We were not in the middle of the cloud when we split, but clearly the laser is having such weird returns with multiple returns and all that that it's actually calculating based on the phase based scanner that it is there's something right in front of this nose when there wasn't. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And that's, you know, th th this is, again, this is noise that does not follow a reasonable statistical pattern, which means it's really hard to write things to filter it out. Um, but yeah, I do think the double scan feature on, on scanners that support it would get a lot of it. Um, and so then that cool. coupled with an intensity filter, maybe, and I actually tried that with this, is to crank up your intensity filter, and it does go away, but you've got to go all the way up to 70%, clip you're down, data. <laughs> and, you're, and you're losing good data. But if you've scanned sufficient coverage there, then Maybe that's okay. Maybe it's a trade-off that you want to do. Yeah. All right. Cool beans. I'm noob, not noob question. Oh no! Before you leave that, I have a noob question. So I I do know that scans at the point cloud and the color from the pictures or whatever that 360 is is coming together. But I'm thinking here, is there a, any association between that color and those points to say fil like filter by color and that's a wipe good all point. that out, right? My, so, my my PowerPoint skills in there were really coming into play because you know so the, the we'll get rid notice, of background color. <laughs> you'll notice some of the steam is green, right here. Yeah. And some of the steam is white. And so the reason why is um, it's actually picking the scanner is getting uh, the picture 
and the picture is no range information. So if you looked in the real view, it's you're seeing clouds and you're seeing trees and you're seeing the steam. And whether the point gets the cloud, the trees, the steam, or some other color is based on where it is with pixels. And the interesting thing about scanners is the pixels do not have a one-to-one -one correlation with the points that get measured. So depending on your scan settings, you might have a single pixel mapped to multiple points, or you might have multiple pixels mapped to a single point. And then it's kind of, and it also depends on where you are because points get really dense above the scanner because the polar stripes come together. And so uh, it's not super reliable, uh, which is why nobody does a lot of RGB-based filtering. Also, a lot of scanners have small offsets, and so then you end up with some kind of parallax, uh, you know, issue. Uh, but that is a great question. So this brings That's us to the end question. As the sort of novel thinking, we need to all be contributing to the greater scanning. That's community. why I'm here. <laughs> So, um, Sylvia, I don't think we have time for the example because we got a haul That's now. That's I do want to talk briefly about transient noise. So, um, this is me, by the way. Uh, and yeah, this actually, normally, I, you know, my, my old spiel was this was me 30 pounds lighter, but I actually think I weigh less than I did in this picture now. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm actually happy about that. It's <laughs> the first time I've been able to say that in 15 years. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this, this it, transient noise is basically moving, uh, people, cars, things moving through the space, um, given I'm not moving very fast, uh, but, uh, this is, uh, temporary things in your scan. Uh, there's some really cool tools to clean this up automatically. Uh, actually Scott, the company you mentioned earlier has some tools to do that. Um, uh, I know Cyclone has some tools to do that. Obviously, double scanning is another mechanism to do that if your scanner supports it. And I know, Scott, I think you've actually, you guys have a, a solution you've come up with yourself that uh, you can compare two scan. You just run two scans separately in the same location. And then you guys actually do it programmatically on your own rather than relying on the firmware or the software to do it. Uh, to that, that's exactly right. And, and we're, we're banging on Farrah's door to implement that in its for, firmware. Uh, we'll see if that's coming. All righty. But the, yeah. the challenge with, with that, Kelly, is that you know we're, we're talking about uh, transient data. Um, if he's not moving and he's stationary, well, and not, all of these filters will not work. Well, yeah, but then it's not transient data. Yeah, but the clients might, might want to remove all the cars, not only the ones that are in motion, but all the cars, part cars. So then oh. that needs to be done manually. Furniture? Yeah. Mm. No. Which takes us to incidental noise, which is exactly what Sylvia you just described. Or in my case, in my house, I swear my house is in there somewhere, but you can't see it through all the bushes and trees, um, right? Incidental noise is, they're good capture. It's, it's, it's legitimate data. And thank you, Scott, for this definition and, and name, by the way. Because uh, I was like, what do you call this? And Scott was like, oh, we call that incidental noise. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's good capture. That, and I was like, oh, great. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's legitimate data that you just don't care about. You don't want. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't benefit you or the client. It's just there. And so you want to clean that stuff out, uh, sometimes, you know, get rid of all the trees so you can actually see stuff, uh, get rid of the bushes so you can see the ground, get rid of the cars so you can see the, uh, the driveway, whatever it is. So, um, yeah. And those are, and again, this is for cleaning this, it's pretty much manual. There's not, you know, algorithmic ways to clean this out because the computer doesn't know what you do and don't care about, right? So this well, is all- well, but Yeah, but I mean, the com componentization <laughs> of, of scan data into different pieces would potentially allow you to then start deleting them manually, but you still have to know what is a wall from a couch, from a car, from whatever, right? You need more AI and machine learning. Yes, and so you're 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 knocking on segmentation uh, of point clouds, which I mean, technically cleaning noise is segmentation. It's segmenting the noise from the not noise. Um, but um, but I do want to take a moment to to you know, Sylvie kind of brought this up earlier. Should you clean? Should you not clean? Um, and uh, Scott, I know you had some thoughts on this as well. Um, you want to summarize your thoughts on cleaning versus not cleaning, and when you should, when you shouldn't. Oh golly, I don't know what you're referring to. I've got a lot of thoughts, but uh, I want to be, I want to answer your question. To which to which thought are you referring? 
<laughs> what, 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 I guess. Yeah. I would I say, say I summarize it. Yeah. The general rule is don't clean data unnecessarily. If you're not going to hand off a point cloud and it's not going to affect your registration and it's not going to affect the modeling team's ability to extract geometry from that point cloud, it's a waste of effort. Uh, any of those other things that, that may be a uh, reason for concern, I would say it's worth looking at cleaning up the data. So if your client wants to see your house there, uh, Kelly, in the point cloud and the 3D and spin it around and say, isn't that cool, and understand the shape of your house, they can't do that with the, he or she cannot do that with uh, those trees in there, and they should be cleaned out in some way. Yeah. Uh, but but not was, permanently, right? Because you never know if you might need, need them later. Right. So yeah, maybe separate. don't delete, but sort of uh, segmentate it, you know, put it in a different bucket and turn it on later. But yes, I agree. But I would submit if you're just trying to model your house, you don't need to worry about cleaning out those trees. In, unless you're craning something in and you're worried about where the trees are. Because again, the constructability expert in me goes, no, I definitely want to know where those trees are, but I want them mostly turned off until I start right. doing constructability and 4D and things like that. Yeah. And so this would be an example of cleaning out all that uh, all that uh, incidental noise, right? And then, yeah, to your point, it, what incidental noise to one person is 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 valuable information to another person, which is the other reason why, like, you don't want to delete the points or or ever completely get rid of them. You always want that original data to go back to because something that you thought was useless data might, at another point in time, be super valuable data. Like, oh gosh, you know, we didn't pick up this, uh, you made this example, Scott, we didn't pick up this exit sign in any of the scans, but it's reflected in the bathroom, so I mirror, so I can go look at the data and then model it where it should be, even though the data is not where it should be, but at least I know it's there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all, all sorts of kind of fun examples like that. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I agree 100%. You should only clean data when it adds value. You should never waste time and therefore blow away profitability for no reason um, for data. I think one thing that's a nice point to make there is who's modeling has a big impact for me on how much I recommend cleaning. People mm -hmm. that have worked with point clouds a lot, they're used to interpreting the data and they know what's noise and they know what's not noise. And so you don't need to clean for them. People that are modeling for the first time with scan data, oh my God, like I've spent oh, yeah. a ridiculous amount of time explaining what a scan, why they, that's not real. You know, like, oh, well, it's not a, the beam's not like this, the beam's like this. No, that's mixed pixel noise. The beam, it's not a, it's not an angled beam on one size. It's just mixed. Oh, you know, oh, no, there's not a bathroom in the hallway. It's reflected data. It, there's a mirror. It, there, there's, uh, I've yeah, actually, the, the bathrooms are probably the, you know, you see people just placing walls in the middle of the corridor and, and there are no walls there. Nope. So good old uh, mirror. Good old mirror. Uh, there's also, I don't, I don't know if this pertinent to this discussion, but in the act of cleaning, and this might be a very specific thing to Faro uh, workflows, but there's two different ways to clean. And one, especially with, uh, you know, one is actually getting rid of the pixels and the, but it preserves your planar view and the other is actually clipping out the data so that your planar view looks like there's nothing there and i'm not going to get into the nuances of both but they have their strengths and weaknesses uh, i think sometimes it's nice to preserve that planar view or the bubble view or the 360 view and get rid of the actual data behind it yeah yeah it's like with cyclone uh and uh, uh register 360 is exact I don't think you can control that. I haven't found a way you can control that. Once you delete uh, the points um, from from your like default cloud that are, that is used for registration, um, you're actually gonna have you're not gonna have any more uh, pixels to be converted into RGB into I'm sorry, no points to be converted into pixels when you're creating your bubble views. So uh, if you're deleting any points from your default cloud, you're actually gonna have just a hole in your bubble view. Um, yeah. If you're deleting it after the registration, so before the export, uh, you're not affecting the bubble view. Um, yeah. So um, it's very, very interesting that you know if you if you have a mirror, you're just going to have a, a black uh, surface there. You're not going to see anything. Yeah, if, we we can speak to how what those workflows, the differences and 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 seen. 
Uh, but let's let you move on though. Yeah, let's, let's do that for q and I think the last couple minutes here, I, I do want to talk a little bit about segmentation because that's kind of, again, all of this is really different types of segmentation. Segmentation is a broad term, is just putting the points into buckets based on stuff. And we talked about doing it based off noise. Um, there's also, uh, people do a lot of spatial segmentation. So this is something a lot of clients ask for is like, hey, can you break it up by structural bay? Or can you break it up by area, like wing one, wing two, you know, central hall? Can you break it up by level? Can you break it up by whatever? Those are all a volumetric uh, segmentation. So you're just spatially segmenting the point cloud by area or location. But there are some tools out there that do other interesting types of segmentation. Um, so for instance, um, uh, point fuse is a cool tool that uh, will mesh and segment a point cloud based on the surfaces, the surface characteristics of the mesh. And that's pretty that's that's pretty cool. You get a lot of segments, um, and so it's not like it's a magic button for for you know scan to BIM or anything like that. But it's a really cool way of kind of changing the point cloud from you know 30 million points to you know 8,000 segments, and then being able to interact with the point cloud in a different way. Um, and then uh, uh, the the thing you see on the screen or saw on the screen earlier, I guess I'll share again here. Um, this, you know, where I, I turned off the point cloud uh, of everything but the existing house, right? Because I think unified. There we go. Then apply. Turn it back on. All the all the trees and stuff, real quick. Um, boom. Right. That that hot mess. The way that was kind of taken down to just this is actually kind of an inverse process, where I quickly built a an as built uh, an existing model of of this house, and uh, then I ran it through our Verity software, which actually segments by object, so it maps points to the objects, and then I just exported out all the points associated with uh, with the uh, the model that I made, and then just that quickly I now have a uh, you know, a point cloud of just the elements that were used to make the model. And you'll notice all the noise of the furniture, all the noise of, uh, you know, I didn't model the kitchen countertop, so the kitchen's missing. Uh, <laughs> basically, everything that wasn't modeled, I now don't have the points for it. Uh, and then I have the inverse thing. I've got all the, the, the other points and stuff, so I can turn stuff on or off and just segment it like that. And then this is fun because I can also, I, I didn't, you can phase it, right? <laughs> yeah, I can phase it. So this is this is like my personal new favorite. Like this is completely abusing our software. It's not meant for this, but, <laughs> but sometimes you can use software to do things it wasn't meant to do. Basically, I'm doing a renovation on this house, and you'll notice there's now holes in the walls, and there's there's places missing. Uh, that's because all that stuff is going to get demoed out, and I was actually able to then resegment the point cloud based off stuff that's getting demoed and existing to remain. And now I just have point clouds for what's existing to remain, which means I can leave my points to have clouds turned on in my plans and sections because I don't have a bunch of points that aren't there anymore. I just have the points that are going to be there, which means maybe I don't have to model as accurately because I can just leave the point cloud on and people can see the variation in the thickness of a 15 inch triple life masonry wall. Um, as that's, opposed a, that's a clever application of modeling there, but I, I think it's smart. We, yeah. we all need to get smart. Oh, yeah. That's clever. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm using that for sure. Yeah, yep, we we're going to do this on Nathan's uh, Nathan's project for sure. Yeah, a lot, a lot of exposed brick, old, yeah, 1906. It's going to be all over the place. But yeah, why, why bother with making the model perfect? We can, you can just bring in the point cloud. It's exactly what you need and nothing more. Right. Yeah, yeah and no, Kelly, problem, one thing, you know. You clean it up to get there, right? But this happened in 20 minutes. <laughs> Uh, just to tie into uh, what you just said, I think um, one thing that we haven't discussed is the most aggressive way of cleaning or the reason why you're cleaning, and that's for analysis. If you mm -hmm. have like floor flatness analysis, um, like that's when, you know, if you have like stuff on the floor, um, that's probably the most aggressive and most time consuming uh, type of cleaning. So yeah. if anyone has questions about that process, they can uh, just uh, submit it to you and we can help them out. Yeah, and Q&A, definitely. So with that, um, thank you all for sticking around. We're a minute over time. Uh, for those of you that have other obligations, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you can you can shuffle off this and hop onto your next Zoom. Um, the crew and I here, as we're available, will hang around for about the next 30 minutes just to do a live Q&A. Uh, uh, 
as as we do for Scandinavian University. And uh, we will uh, you know go through that. If you need to bail, bail. Uh, if you've asked a question and we answer it, check the recording. You'll get the you'll get the link in about a week. Yes, it is all recorded. Uh, yes, if anybody else that you know wants to see it. Have them, uh, you know, click the link and register. Even though yes, the sessions already happened. If they register for it, they'll get the the recording sent to them. So, uh, and thank you to all our wonderful panelists. Thank you guys for being here. Um, and uh, with that, if anybody needs to bail, bail, and that includes you guys. Uh, if, if any of you guys need to go to something, you can. But we will. Um, you know, with that, let's 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 hit some of these questions that have been coming in. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to take this one. This one's fun. So um, the the first question was whether or not this is the Apple headquarters building. Uh, so I will was, guarantee this, this is a Coliseum, right? This was the that was kind of like ten years ago. Yeah, no, actually. So this 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 is the this is Reunion Tower in Dallas, Texas. So oh yeah, we know that one. Yeah. This is the reunion tower this is the ball on top of those that giant concrete pillar uh, next to the convention center and so this uh it's basically a big a big you know ball with uh you know glass on the outside right um so uh the entire exterior is curtain wall and there's just all sorts of crazy ref reflections and refractions in it so this is that i guarantee you apple would not have given us permission to share a picture of laser scans of their building <laughs> They are pretty serious about their NDAs, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, but that's a funny question. Um, all right, let's see here. Most challenging type of dirty data is in a manufacturing plant. My scanner hits those, ooh, excellent, use of curse words in the Q&A, hits those damn domed mirrors at every aisle intersection and picks yeah. up data in strange areas. Oh, the domed mirrors, oh. Yeah. oh. I feel your pain, man. So I will tell you, that's where cleaning it up from the scanner perspective will save your life, right? Oh, because yeah. the scanner perspective, it's just the frustrum. You just do a circle around the mirror, hit delete, it's all gone. If you try and clean it up in the 3D view, that's miserable because you can't it's 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 just it's wonky yeah it's all sorts of crazy so yeah no uh, do it do it from the scanner perspective and it'll be a lot easier to clean up um uh but you have to do that by scan per scan but uh but yeah um great question uh is there a way to clean up data in field 360 sylvia i got you'd have to answer that question yeah yes it is in field 360 or in register 360? Field 360. Uh, no, no, it's not. Yeah. All right. So no way to clean up data in field 360. Um, we, uh, I have used RealWorks. We have a RealWorks Pro at ClearEdge. Uh, I don't think there's an option to remove noise before registration. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there is. Uh, last time I talked with uh, Trevor about it, who's the guy on our team that knows RealWorks best, or Justin. Uh, who also knows it. Um, I don't believe there's a way to do this. There's also not a way to do it in recap. Um, so scene will let you do it. Um, uh, Cyclone will let you do it. I presume register 360 will let you do it, Sylvia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I know reconstructor will let you do it. Um, so there's there's definitely tools that will let you do it. But um, but yeah, I'm I'm unaware of any options to do that in um, in uh, uh, real works be a great question for your real works rep um, i know that back in the day before we knew how to do this our rule was if we've got projects that have a lot of uh, mirrors and a lot of glass on the interior we would not register them cloud to cloud we'd rely on targets because if you rely on targets you don't have to worry about that pre-registration uh, so this is an, another one of those cases where uh, you may not want to use cloud to cloud uh, if you don't have a mechanism to clean that up and you've got a lot of that data um, you may want to fall back to targets or survey control. If you're a real works user, you've probably got a scanner that can uh, shoot prisms or um, uh, at least uh, capture targets in the field. So uh, either of those mechanisms. Um, let's see. Oh, double side. Yeah, Scott, can you explain your double sided target on a window idea? Sure. Um, the the, the, the app use case for having a double-sided target is that if you are scanning the fifth floor of a 
office complex and you want to get survey control up there and they don't have operational windows to open and put prisms in there and things you could put a double-sided target meaning one i don't have any targets laying around here but if it was printed such that the intersection of the black and white on the front face is the same as the intersection of the black and white on the back face they can be rotated about but it's actually easy to do in the field in a pinch stick a thumbtack through there put them together and uh, tape them but to put them on the window from the inside where you can get to it and then shoot them with your total station from the ground level outside uh, i get a little bit squeamish with that with those double plane windows when they have an inch of uh, airspace in there that's probably full of vacuum or argon gas but again i think it is minimal refraction error in that so your scanner on the inside of the building is picking up that target it's got the same control point as was shot from the ground on the uh, sidewalk below so i assume uh, it's called that uh, uh helps with the rotation right if you're only using uh, stairwells to connect those levels together, uh, having those targets helps tremendously with a rotation and tying them all with, uh, to the exterior. Relying, I mean, scanning up stairwells is a pain. It's no fun. It's really not that valuable information, especially in commercial space where stairwells are stairwells. Once you get one, you, you know how they replicate and you can introduce some twist into there. And so, yes, we've got ways to combat that with getting on opposite ends of the building, but you don't always have that luxury. I'd much prefer to shoot it with a total station with a double-sided target. Yeah. yeah, or even with the scanner outside picking up the target. If uh, if you're running, scan. that's uh, exactly right. Uh, it, 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 if you don't have to, you can you can do the same trick from the outside with the scanner. Um, cool. Uh, James Kennelly did point out that Cyclone can do intensity segmentation, so you can in, you can yeah. take import all the points and segment by intensity. And sometimes uh, that will work. It's again, it's one of those things where, like, if you're scanning a commercial space, it works really well because drywall, painted drywall, the kind of typical surface inside the building typically return really brightly to the scanner, and you don't have really long range shots. And the stuff that goes through glass is much lower intensity because you lose a lot of light every time it goes through. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in a plant, there's a whole lot of data that's, you know, on pipes and things that is in that low intensity range. And if you segment by intensity, you, you don't, you know, <laughs> you end up losing a lot of data that you actually care about. Also, so it's been on the project, but that is a great pro tip. Um, yeah. And also, uh, I think Scott mentioned earlier that um, your scanners do better when the laser is perpendicular on the glass and the surface behind it is, you know, is somewhat per perpendicular or parallel to the glass. And uh, in that case, your intensity is not going to be... Um, uh, a low intensity so it's going to resemble like a normal uh, space so you're not going to see this red uh, all these red points sometimes it's going to look like you know green and blue and so yeah. your segmentation might not work in those cases yeah absolutely um, we have a couple people talking about recap um, cleaning and recap it, t it tends to crash after a few instances of selecting points and deleting anybody else have this issue yeah, I will say though to Autodesk credit, it's gotten better. It, about three years ago, they went through a stint there. If you did more than five operations of clipping, it, it ground to a halt. I mean, it was just impossible. So it is better now, uh, but it is, it's not perfect. I will agree. Yeah. And recap regions. So recap, uh, speaking of segmentation, recap has the regions and those can be pretty useful if the application you're going into supports the regions, which for a while, I know Revit didn't, but I believe newer versions of Revit do and you can turn on or off yes. regions, super yep. nice. Yep. Uh, so you can kind of segment uh, that way. Um, also Kelly, uh, on um, if you're doing the same process in, in Cyclone, if somebody is trying actually to clean their entire registration, hundreds or thousands of scans in the final model space view, uh, you will have the same experience that you have with Recap. I mean, it's gonna take you a lot more uh, cleaning, uh, but the database is gonna get slower and slower and slower. So you need to pick your ba battles, you know, which points do you wanna clean in the final model space versus which ones do you wanna clean uh, for each individual scan. So, um, you know, that data is, is not being deleted, it's just, kept there in the in the cache so uh yep. he's using a lot of temporary uh space on your drive 
Uh, I, Sylvia, I believe though, if you optimize that database and uh, uh, and then reopen the model space, that it actually will if reset. You want to wait a few hours? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, just every <laughs> night, optimize it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, Pharo scene or recap for cleaning. Uh, <laughs> If I had to choose between scene and recap, and I, I hate scene personally, but I would choose scene any day of the week over recap. <laughs> so the the worst of two evils, I guess, the lesser of two evils. Uh, yeah, no, scene, scene is white. actually reasonably accommodating for, yes. for cleaning up. It, yes, we've got a thousand frustrations with the Faro scene software but it is pretty accommodating in terms of using the perspective of the scanner to grab an area, look at it in 3D view, turn it ortho, and all of those issues about the undersides or the fascia boards of going through glass. And you can work around that pretty well in the scene. Yeah, I, like, I always just like to explain, like to me, recap is primarily a, a, a tool for viewing a format for use in design applications. And it's really not designed to do anything else very well. It's a, it's like this, it's like the photo editing software that comes with the $150 camera that you buy through Amazon, right? Oh, I agree. Right, it's not Photoshop. And then, you know, all of the other applications, be it Scene or Cyclone or, um, uh, you know, Reconstructor or whatever, you know, Laser Control, they're all much more professional grade tools. Uh, so just hands down, choose one of those. Um, uh, let's see. Da -da -da. Um, See what would the oh uh, what would what would the workflow is there a workflow to remove registration uh, uh, remove noise before registration in scene so Scott can you can you tell us how to do that in scene is there a workflow to remove the before? noise before yeah before doing cloud to cloud if uh, is, well for one I'll say we generally only use cloud to cloud and and sort of unique situations where there's no sort of global accuracy dependency on that, you know, an offshoot or a like a branch of a major project is fine for us to use cloud to cloud. But regardless, I don't see a ton of impact that clouded, uh, sorry, cleaning the data before clouded registration has other than in the case of, uh, you know, top-down registration where it's looking for vertical planes and you've got a scan in the bathroom that had the wall that's in the middle of the corridor, that sort of thing can throw things off. But if you've got a general correspondence view of, of general placement, uh, all that blowout stuff, the red that's on your screen right now, Kelly, is not going to affect the clouded registration. Um, so, so, I mean, so before registration, I don't really know that I've answered your question other than to say each scan has to be done individually. If you insist upon it, if it hasn't been registered yet, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, the, I mean, the the I I don't think last it's kind of like real works. Like I, I I they don't have like a really robust the people the people that I've heard doing this basically they go they just bring the scans in they then clean them out and they go through some process of basically um, just rerunning a registration with the scans after they've cleaned them up individually, um, which is which is kind of a I don't know, but that's that's the workflow that I've heard described. But I'm not a I'm yeah. Not a, I would be very open to someone challenging. I I don't see a need for that at all. But if uh, someone wants to PM me or email or call or whatever and, and discuss it further, uh, I'm very open to that. I don't see a need for that. Yeah, I mean the, the um, as I mentioned earlier, the need is only if you have uh, 20 to 50 percent of that data that's used for registrations going through glass. Because in that in that case, I mean, I've I've seen a lot of misalignments because of uh, refractor data. Oh. Um, but that's the only you know if if you only have just a little bit of data, uh, you know, ten percent of the data going through a window, that's not going to affect that. You have a lot more uh, good data there that will will constrain the uh, the cloud to cloud. Um, so um, that's why I, I I said that you need to selectively clean your your data before registration things that you know like if you have somebody in the field that made a note hey uh, we have a lot of glass here and uh, shopping malls that's one of the instances where you might have to clean every single scan yeah yeah, uh, yeah i had, had a question about um phasing the, the the point cloud phasing thing that i shared on the screen i should probably kill the, the screen since we're just looking at a 
picture of the tower. All right. Um, the, in order to phase the point cloud, uh, are the point clouds separate RCS instead of one segmented cloud? And the answer is yes. Uh, basically, um, it, you could, actually, I don't think you can do this with regions. Um, basically, what, what I ended up doing, if you look at my uh, BG settings, I've got three point clouds that I created out of Verity, where I basically, I, I took the existing model, uh, ran, it, uh, ran it in Verity, uh, to just kind of see where my deviations were, which, by the way, gave me this lovely thing that I can turn on as well, um, right? Because that this was what we actually designed the tool to do, was to be able to do a heat map. So I can kind of say, oh gosh, anything green was modeled within an inch. Uh, so I actually did a pretty good job modeling, apparently. Um, uh, anything blue or anything red is going to be further off. Um, this wall is red because there's a bunch of ivy on it. Uh, and then, um, uh, but anyway, at, at that point, I've also then exported it out using the colors, and uh, then each one of those point clouds is mapped to a phase and has a phase uh, demolished. So the, the existing point cloud, you'll see, is created an existing demolished in phase one. If I change the view here to phase one, that one will disappear, and uh, you'll see a different point cloud, and then that one is created in phase one, demolished in phase three. So I have a you know a, a segmented point cloud for each one of these things. Um, and that was that was all achieved in probably about 30 minutes uh, just by running running through Navisworks and generating segmented point clouds for the existing uh, stuff. So pretty pretty fun, pretty easy to do um, if you've if you've got if you've got our software. Uh, so <laughs> occasionally I get to plug our software on these things, right, guys? Yeah. Um, that is, it is, that's very good. That's a, a clever, clever application of a otherwise very powerful tool. I like hacks. What can I say? Um, let's see. Here's somebody. Hey, Silvio. I have a question this is from uh, Paul. Uh, I have a question. Given the same scanning hardware and settings, does registration software affect data filtering on import? In other words, does Cyclone do better data import filtering than Register 360, et cetera? Um, I haven't tried that to can, compare can, the same data. Daughter, daughter answer the question. Uh, do you know Mia? No? No, she's just uh, <laughs> raising her shoulders. Uh, I haven't tried that to, to import the same, the, the same data in both uh, software and see uh, which one does better. But uh, I mean, you can adjust the uh, the filtering at import uh, for both of them. Yeah. That's an interesting question. I know, for instance, like uh, from experience, the cloud to cloud algorithm in Cyclone is different than the cloud to cloud different. algorithm in yeah. Register 360. So you can get much better results out of the cloud to cloud algorithm in Cyclone, but Register 360 is much faster. Um, so it's one of those kind of uh, funny differences. Um, we had somebody say, ask, do you use 3D Reshaper for cleaning? You can play with different sections, filter the noise, especially in the new version in Cyclone 3DR. I don't think any of us have played with 3D Reshaper recently. Uh, it's no longer called Reshaper. It's a, it's a hexagon product, and I think they rebranded it. Yeah, it's Cyclone 3DR now. Okay. Well, we used to subscribe to that and had great fun, and then we moved on to a different tool, but we were using it more for tank sort of analysis but uh, it was powerful it was good all right any experience using scanners that filter echoes and i don't know what that i i think uh let's see for example regal scanners are easy to filter ground points through vegetation oh okay okay so this is uh you know i know what you're talking about so this is um this is scanners that are using the waveform uh, and they're basically uh, they're they're doing waveform capture, so they can they can capture multiple peaks in the return. So that mixed pixel noise we talked about at the beginning, rather than putting a point in between the stair tread and the floor, you would get a point on the stair tread and a point on the floor. Um, so you can get multiple points per beam. Um, a lot of aerial sensors do this as well um, for obvious reasons. They're scanning through trees to get the ground. Um, I have not messed around with uh, many. Uh, the only scanner that I've messed around with is the Topcon GLS. Uh, that one you can change uh, which of the returns uh, or both of the returns on the waveform, so it'll get up to two. Um, but 
I have not specifically tried to uh, test it out on vegetation um, uh, or I, I think it's a really interesting question. How would this work on indoor building scanning with concern to refractions and reflections? I think the thing that would terrify me is that you might get a point for the refraction and a point for the reflection. So you'd have too many points more, as it is. You'd get, you'd get more noise, not less noise, right? Because they're both bad. Um, you don't want either of them. So I think that's actually like terrifying. <laughs> I don't want more noise. No. Cancel. Cancel. Um, all right. And I think we'll do this one last question and they're slowing down and we'll bail from there. Um, what about the overlap data? When you do multiple scans and have overlap data, is there a quick quick way of doing this. Elena, if you're still on, can you clarify a quick way of doing what? Of removing the overlap? Or um, I, I'm, I'm going to assume that it's just there's more data than you need. And so the, the answer there is most of the softwares have some kind of uh, tool to basically unify. It's but unification is what it's called in Cyclone. I, what is it called in Scene, Scott? uh unification structured unstructured decimation what decimation um, is, yeah they're, they're gridding you can grid the, the, some tools call it gridding basically what it does okay yeah removing it so basically what it because you don't want to remove it before registration certainly if you're using cloud to cloud because then you'd be screwed um but uh you know after you've registered the data um, all of those tools are designed to basically subsample the points and get you down to a certain number of points in gridded voxels, right? That's how they, so voxels are, think about 3D space broken up into little cubes and, you know, limiting the number of points per cube, um, you know, to some amount. And so, like, in, like I said, in Cyclone is called unification. I can actually pull this up uh, since I have Cyclone open. Do I have Cyclone open? I thought I had Cyclone open. Here it is. All right. So, like for instance, if I were to go into this big old model space here that has all of these points, and I've got, you know, this is a house, but Wait, because I, can I see it. Yeah. Oh, bloody heck. Thank you. And I believe uh, Kelly Cyclone is using uh, the volumetric yeah. um, unification. Yep. They're using a volumetric grid, voxel based grid. Um, so, basically, um, you know, I've this is a, it's my house, but I test scanners. So I have like 300 scans of my house, which is absurd. And there's all sorts of duplicate data. I don't need it. I probably have a point per one hundredth of a millimeter uh, at this point. So what you can do in these is uh, you can basically, gosh, it's been so long, unify clouds. Um, so if you do this, uh, you can basically set a spacing and it's for the entire space. Um, and all, all of these, Recap, in fact, has a tool that can do something similar to this as well. Um, basically, you can go through the process and just say, hey, I only need a point. You know, there's various settings that you tweak, but I want a point for every, um, I'm just going to go to millimeter, you know, every one millimeter, right? Um, reduce point cloud spacing, one millimeter. Boom. Um, if I hit Unify, uh, that will go through the process of getting rid of all the points that are duplicate. Uh, it'll do it pretty intelligently. You don't lose data where you have sparse data. You only lose data where you have dense data. It's a really good tool. The only downside is this unstructures the point cloud. You then end up with a giant bag of unstructured points, um, which is good for a lot of reasons, but uh, there are a lot of tools out there that rely on that structured data to do some more advanced stuff. And this is where I'm speaking for my software as well. Uh, our Edgewise software, a lot of the automatic detection features, actually now pipes in particular, is the only one that's left. We've we've made algorithms that work with unified data for everything else, but for the pipe extraction that we do, we'll, we'll find 80 to 90 percent of the pipes for you in your laser scans. Um, that that algorithm requires structured data. You can't use a unified cloud with it. Um, because we need the scanner location and what this does what these kind of tools do is they blow away the scanner locations the points are no longer indexed by scanner location which means you don't know where any point is captured from so tools that rely heavily on side normals knowing what side is the outside or the inside of a surface anything like that is going to be negatively impacted by doing this uh, and, so it's just um, something to be aware of there is a uh, there is a solution at least in um, a cyclone i'm not sure if that exists in uh, register 360 or scene where uh, let's say if you imported all of your all of your points 
we have too much data. Now let's say Kelly's software is like uh, can work with only a sixteenth of that uh, that data. Uh, you can actually uh, reduce the point cloud size uh, and yes. still keep the normals. It's not a unified. It's going to be structured, but it's a manual process where you go under edit. I think edit, edit object and. Uh, you're going to be able to reduce the uh, the point cloud size. Um, yeah, you can, also, you can also do this on import as well uh, in, yeah. a batch, in a batch way by basically uh, when you when you go through the import settings and I, I've seen has a version of this too. Almost everybody does. You can tell it to take every other row and every other column, or every mm -hmm. third row and every third column, or every fifth yeah. row and every fifth column. Right. So you're basically bringing in less dense data than you captured. Uh, which there's a lot of advantages to that in terms of processing speed, in terms of, you know, if you've over captured in the field, which is a very common problem with RTC 360 because uh, it's so bloody fast and people run it at a higher setting than it's needed to, then you can just bring the data in a lower resolution and then everything processes faster, everything, you know, everything kind of runs faster and you have less dense data in general. So that, that's another great way to do it. But the downside of that is you lose data everywhere. So you also, you lose rows and columns on data that's far away from the scanner where you don't have a lot of data. So that's the downside of a grid-based decimation, uh, scanner grid-based decimation versus a, a volumetric voxel grid-based decimation. There's some, uh, I'm throwing some $10 laser scan geek words around there now. Um, cool beans. Well, we are cool. 30 minutes in. I think we should wrap it up. Um, um, uh, Espen Sigmundstad says it's now possible to export decimated structure data from register three. Oh, oh, but no control on point spacing. So he's talking about the exact same thing, being able to do uh, doing a scanner based decimation uh, by by a, a frustrum grid as opposed to by a volumetric grid. So cool. All right. Well, thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, Sylvia, uh, you have a beautiful daughter. Yeah, thank Good you. to see her again. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. All righty. And thank you to our audience. Uh, we will catch you guys at the next one of these, uh, which will come up in a month. So, yeah. uh, and look for Sylvia to be answering additional questions and other stuff on uh, on our laser scanning, uh, I'm sorry, our Scandabim University um, LinkedIn group. Uh, and that all I'm sure will be posted through RC Monkeys as well. And we'll be reposting them as Clear Edge and blah, blah, blah. So. Um, yeah. Adieu Ciao. to all. Adieu. I guess, Adios. I successfully this time. <laughs> Bye.